Uh, Leon de Joan. And then the jaw. Okay. Can you change the You can do Sorry. <laughs> Amen, the job, will you? Yes.
Sì? Il mio nome è Giorgio. Nu-mi spun de ce tot. Eu não vi, não me pondo já, não só tirei de pão, não se pondo já não. Está em pão, está em pão. Okay, uh, sorry for this technical problem. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the International Battle Conference on Challenges of Civil Engineering. 
just as a reminder, uh, I will ask from you to close your microphones while uh, uh, any one of us is presenting, uh, because you might face some some uh, people during the our speeches. So thank you again. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I am Leon Luca, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering at Apoca University and chair of the organizing committee. Uh, dear guest professors, Professor Brito, Professor Schultz, and Professor Kohati, dear professors, members of the International Scientific Committee, dear colleagues of the organizing committee, and participants of the fourth Balkan Conference on Challenges of Civil Engineering, and dear students. As the chair of the fourth uh, BCCE conference, I would like to welcome you and thank you for being with us today in this important scientific event jointly organized by the Uni Epoca University of Albania, Institute of Geosciences of Albania, University of Perugia, Italy, Polytechnic University of Bari, Italy, University of Novi Sad, Serbia, St. Cyril and Methodius University, Republic of Northern Macedonia, George Asaki Technical University of Yashi, Romania, and University of Pristina, Kosovo. Uh, built upon the success of the previous Balkan conferences on challenges of civil engineering, this event promises a wide range of topics on civil engineering and an international audience of academicians and practitioners worldwide. We appreciate your interest in, this, in the conference and believe that the conference will be beneficial to you by providing the state-of-the-art information on different areas and challenges in civil engineering. We are also hopeful that the conference will present to you new scientific research collaboration opportunities. Uh, as all of us know, the mission of universities, as well as of us as academicians, relies on three main pillars, on delivering high quality education to the future generations, produce high quality research and innovation, and contribute to the society through different social and educational activities. There is a lot to do for us out there. There is a great need for good professionals in academia as well as in civil engineering practice. Last year, on November 26, Albania was hit by a 6.4 earthquake, causing the death of 51 people, 30,000 injured, and 5,200 people moving from their homes. Many of us contributed voluntarily during the process of damage assessment of the affected buildings, but as the famous word says, earthquakes don't kill, poorly designed and constructed buildings do. So it's our duty to do to design those buildings properly, to construct properly, and to educate good professionals uh, in this field. Our world is changing faster than we could imagine. Only till one year ago, we were able to meet in international forums and conferences, teach face to face to our students, exhibit laboratory tests, and shake hands after achieving our goals. But nowadays, due to COVID-19, we have to adapt to this unpredicted situation and continue to do our jobs as good as possible. And I guess all of us managed to succeed. And your participation in this conference is one of its proofs. On the other hand, due to climate change, the world today is facing numerous challenges, natural and man-made hazards such as disasters due to earthquake and tsunamis, landslides, rising sea level, and other land resources and related problems, floods, fires, etc. We also need to improve our building calls, find solutions to old building stock and demolition waste management, protect our cultural heritage, focus on green energy production and sustainable project management, and so on. Moreover, the construction industry is passing through rapid changes and development, which puts us under a great pressure to develop innovative and efficient solutions. We hope that events such as the one we are participating today 
is one of those that may contribute as much as possible to the above mentioned problems. Thank you again for being here and wish you a nice time. Uh, I want to invite, I would like to invite our team uh, to make a welcome speech to all the uh, attendees of this event. Thank you, Professor Sokol. Thank the floor you. is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me in uh, this very important conference. Distinguished professors, dear participants, on behalf of the Epoca University, we are greatly honored and pleased to welcome you all virtually <laughs> to the fourth International Balkan Conference on Challenges of Civil Engineering. We are actually so proud and thankful that the Department of Civil Engineering is organizing the established high-level conference which is the fourth right now. It's quite established throughout the years and in collaboration with other institutions as mentioned by uh, Dr. Luga. This is a, such an important venue for all of us to, to bring a research community together and to serve as a platform to disseminate knowledge, urge collaborations and to reaffirm our commitments and identify key areas in civil engineering. Uh, I would like to talk something, some words about our university. Epoca University is founded in 2007, and since then has aspired to be one of the services to Albania and the world, preparing its students to meet the challenges of the future with courage, with confidence, and with creativity. Our programs provide talented young people with advanced skills that will launch them into successful professional careers and make them important and significant contributors to the society. In our recent years, Epoca University has steadily been building the capacity to create an outstanding university. Also, we are facing the challenges of the, uh, the COVID-19 and we are trying our best to incorporate different methods, including high flex and project-based research in our teaching and research uh, activities. We are now in the area of rapid technological changes that influence the way in which the research community interacts and communicates science. This is such a great opportunity to all of us to provide exchange ideas, tackling numerous issues, progress, setbacks made to date in relevant spheres, as well as best practices and valuable lessons learned. I expect that our scientific presentations in this conference will inform policies in the year ahead because the setting of the conference is a rather unique one. We are so proud to have very uh, distinguished keynote speakers and delegates. So it makes a very international character of the attendance and the combination of different areas that, Professor, that Dr. Luga just mentioned in civil engineering, which is a wide broad of topics, which are very interesting for me also as an architect brings together a variety of experiences. I'm very hopeful that this floor will be as active as possible in all the sessions to enrich the discussion and to facilitate a stimulating exchange of, of views. I would like to thank all the people who have worked toward the successful preparation and organization of this conference, especially I would like to thank the chair of the conference, Dr. Ayon Luga, for his dedication and all the very dedicated uh, department, which are so proud that we have in civil engineering and all the other organizing committee members. We truly value your participation and support of this conference in these very difficult times that we are trying our best to pass all of us. Thank you very much for coming virtually and for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Professor, uh, now I would like to uh, invite our one, the first keynote speaker of our conference, Professor Brito, a very distinguished professor from the University of Lisbon uh, in uh, Portugal. Uh, professor, uh, thank you for being here with us today and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the, uh, my uh, friends from Albania for inviting me to this conference. I'm going to share the screen, if I may. Uh, can I can I share the screen, uh, Arian? 
Can you allow me to share the screen? You can okay, repeat. good, you good. Share. I can do it now. Yes. Okay. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, building pathology and um, uh, how to approach uh, this uh, very important issue uh, in a systematic way. Um, this is, this is a, 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 a sentence from a, um, an intellectual from the 6th, 17th century from Portugal. And he says that from an error, uh, many arise and on such wrong foundation, there has never been a right building. And so we, we should learn from our mistakes. And so it's very important to understand uh, how uh, uh, the buildings react uh, in a wrong way when we don't do things properly. So uh, this, this is the syllabus of my, of my presentation. I'm going to have an introduction, then I'm going to talk about uh, the inspection system as we perceive it. And then I'm going to take you around in a journey on building pathology, which I think will be interesting, especially for the colleagues who are civil engineers and architects. And then a, a couple of final remarks. Um, well, uh, we have been working for a long time uh, in, in this subject here at IST. And so what we have been trying to do is to understand the life cycle of the buildings. Uh, as you know, the buildings are built uh, in, the, in the first place. That takes a very short time. And then at the end of their life, they are demolished or refurbished which also takes a relatively short time. Most of the time we are in this uh, uh, stage of the operation and maintenance. And a few uh, more or less obvious remarks can be made about this stage. Buildings need to be followed periodically. They, we, need, we need to look at them uh, uh, every, every uh, with a, with a given frequency. Uh, different types of degradation need to be estimated because buildings degrade like, just like living, living bodies. The performance of building elements also needs to be assessed, uh, which is not exactly the same as degradation. And of course, we need to make decisions on maintenance, repair and replacement. And, uh, the common point between all of these uh, obvious remarks is inspection. We need to inspect our buildings. And so um, we are, I'm going to talk about building inspection systems. Uh, why, why am I talking about building inspection systems? Because we need, we need very much objective information. We need information in, on a periodic basis. So we need, we need uh, uh, to know when and how to inspect. We need to locate degradation in terms of the building, where and what, in terms of the building element, where and what again, in terms of the defects and their causes, where and what again. Then we need to have a common uh, name for all involved concepts. I will talk about that later on but we need to have uh, to, to call the same name to the same things, uh, namely defects in a building so that everybody understands everybody. Uh, and then we need to measure, we need to measure what's going on. We need to measure the affected areas. We need to measure, for example, cracking. We need to measure the temperature at the, at, at the time of the inspection. We need to measure, in some cases, the moisture content of materials and even the average uh, environmental humidity. And also, at the end, we need to classify and quantify the degradation and uh, uh, conclude something about the urgency of repair. So uh, uh, summing up, we need an independent inspection uh, that uh, keeps subjectivity to a minimum. Now, 
as I said, we have been working on this for a long time, uh, actually, uh, since my PhD thesis in the 18th century. Uh, and uh, that was still in bridges. Uh, uh, now we are working very much more in buildings. And we came to the conclusion that within an uh, inspection diagnosis uh, system, we need a classifying system. What do we need to classify? We need to classify the defects. We need to classify their causes. We need to classify the diagnosis methods that we can use to classify those methods, to, to, to diagnose the defects. We need to uh, uh, classify the repair techniques that we use to eliminate the defects and the causes. And in order to uh, uh, have a common and objective uh, nomenclature about all of these, we need files. We need files of defects. We need files of diagnosis methods. We need files of repair techniques. In these files, we sum up the most important information about each of these uh, 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 concepts. Then we have used tools that are correlation matri matrices. In these correlation matrices, we, we link, we correlate different concepts, such as defects and their causes, such as defects and other defects, such as defects and diagnosis methods, such as defects and repair techniques. And all of these is, uh, can be uh, uh, all the information that we collect uh, during an inspection can be inserted in a, a, a formal, in a, 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 um, a template, which we call uh, an, inspect form, an inspection form. Now, if I may talk about the defects, we have devo developed uh, uh, about 13 different inspection systems. Each of these inspection systems focus on one single construction element. Then what we did, and that's, that's what I'm going to show you here, we, we melted all of those certain inspection systems into a global inspection system, which was a huge work, as you will see. So in terms of defects, we finally came to a list of uh, 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 38 defects in four categories. For your information, we, we, we had something like 200 defects in those 13 uh, inspection systems, and we, we merged them uh, uh, in order to make information more compact. And to, to, to show you how we acted, we have uh, this first category, which is called defects of physical nature. I'm going to illustrate each of these defects further on. Then we have another category, which is called defects of a chemical nature, okay, in which we have six entries. Then we have uh, defects of a mechanical nature, in which we have uh, 11 entries. I think the names, the names of the categories are self-explanatory. And then we have the defects that we could not fit in the other three categories, which we called other defects. And they are very miscellaneous, uh, uh, but you know we, we could not find a way of organizing them further than this. Then we did the same thing for the causes of defect, and I'm going just to show you uh, uh, the the highlights of this. We 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 considered a list of 108 uh, causes of defects, and we organized those causes in five categories. The design errors, which also include the wrong choice of materials, the execution errors, uh, the mechanical actions, which happen after the, 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 the elements have been put into, in, in place. Then we have the environmental actions. And finally, we have the use and maintenance errors. Even though I'm not showing you this here, we also did this for the diagnosis methods, and we also did this for the repair techniques. And of course, we also did, uh, um, we, we, we also 
developed all those correlation matrices that I told you about. And uh, one file for each defect, each, each uh, diagnosis method, and each repair technique. I'm not going to show you that, but it's, uh, uh, it's just for you to have an idea of what we did. Now, in order to uh, give an example of uh, the, 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 the organization of the categories of the causes of defects, here we have the mechanical actions. As you can see, we have all types of mechanical actions that can cause defects in buildings. Now I'm going to show you just a very small excerpt of the defects and probable, defects probable causes correlation matrices, methods. Uh, this is it. In this case, we only included categories of defects uh, A, 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 B, and A, C, and we only consider the causes of defect from uh, uh, C, D, uh, the, 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 the ones that have to, to do with the environmental action. Now, this is just an excerpt for each element we have around 4,000 of these numbers, okay? This is all inside a, 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 a tool, a, an informatic tool, but these, these are around 4,000 correlation indexes that we have here. Zero means there is no correlation. One means there is uh, some correlation. It's probably a secondary cause and two, it means there is a strong correlation, meaning that probably the cause is the primary cause or one of the primary causes of the defect. By the way, we in the correlation matrices, uh, uh, we have layers for each element. For example, this corresponds to the layer of natural stone cladding. So you have to multiply these 4,000 numbers by certain uh, individual elements. Now, this is the, the journey I, want, I, I told you about. We are going now on a journey and uh, a travel uh, through different building defects according to that list. So I'm going to show you 38 types of building defects. And I'm starting with the defects of physical nature. And the first one is the leakage damp, which is illustrated here for a wall render. As you can see, because of, of poor design, this area is very damp. And of course, it has damaged the render. The next, the next uh, uh, defect uh, is called surface moisture. And is illustrated here for uh, door and window frames. And as you can see, again, this door and window frame has an unusual level of surface moisture that shouldn't happen. The third uh, defect that I want to show you is dirt and accumulation of debris. And it is illustrated here in a painted facade in which you can see that for some reason, uh, this area is very dirty. So this has to do, the, the, the cause of this uh, is difficult to appraise just based on the photo, as I will remark at the end of the, my presentation. Uh, the next uh, um, photos concern three other defects, all also of physical nature. Now, this one is called color changes and is illustrated here in an architectural concrete surface in which, as you can see, the, the, the corrosion of that of that pipe has uh, uh, caused a change of color in this surface. The next uh, defect uh, is called uh, generally spalling, peeling, or exfoliation and pop out. We, we decided to merge all of these uh, defects because they look similar. And in this case, we have in a painted facade, as you can see, lots of problems here, maybe arising from rising damp. The next uh, defect is called cohesion loss or disaggregation and chalking. 
you can see in this wall render that it is in a very poor condition. And this is probably due to the wrong material and uh, aging of the material. The next uh, uh, defects are already, uh, or are already of a, a chemical nature. And the first one of those is called biodegradation, biological growth. This is a very common defect in buildings. And as you can see in this uh, example of a wall render, it results from, again, poor design. The, 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 the design is such that the water dribbles over this surface. And of course, this creates the right conditions for biological growth. Vegetation growth is the next defect. In this case, uh, 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 we uh, are exemplifying it in a, adhesive, uh, in a adhesive ceramic tiling. And as you can see, it, it results mostly from lack of maintenance in the, of this area. The next defect is called efflorescence, cryptoefflorescence and carbonation. It has to do with salts and carbonates that can crystallize. And in this case, uh, uh, using the, 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 the example of a, an architectural concrete surface, you can see there that has been heavy crystallization of salt in that area, which is probably also associated with a drainage problem in the facade. The next uh, uh, defects are still of a chemical nature. And the, 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 the next one is blistering bulging. Uh, it is illustrated in this wall render. And it is very likely that these bulges have been created by water that accumulated be, uh, 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 at the back of the outer surface of the wall render. The next step, the next uh, defect is called uh, corrosion on the current surface. And in this case, it is illustrated in a, a, a door, uh, uh, in, in a door in which you can see that there is widespread corrosion. There is not pit corrosion, but there is a widespread corrosion uh, uh, resulting naturally from old age. The oh, next, oh, okay, thanks. The next uh, uh, defect is called corrosion in metallic fastening or tail end elements. And it is illustrated here by uh, uh, an example in an external cladding of a pitched roof, in which all of these fastenings here, which are metallic, are heavily corroded. And that means that the, 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 they don't work anymore. So they, they need to be replaced. Going on to the defects of a mechanical nature, the first one that I want to show you is called mapped cracking. It is illustrated here in a flat roof in which it is very obvious that the problem has been a, a shrinkage of the, of, the, of the cladding that is in there. So uh, after a while, this is what it looks like. The next step, the next defect, I'm sorry, is oriented cracking on the current surface instead of uh, cracking such as these in which we have no defined direction. This one is illustrated in a wall render in which you can see there is a clear crack here, which is possibly linked to a, a, a change of materials underneath the wall renders, which has not been properly uh, detailed. Now, this is now a, a very important effect, which is called fracture or splintering on the current surface. And it is illustrated by a cladding made of natural stone, uh, which has uh, uh, been, uh, which is fractured. We are not sure what happened here. It could be a shock. Uh, it could be a, a, a settlement of the foundation. But in, in this case, in the photo, it is difficult to understand exactly the nature of the cause. Now, the next defect is called cracking and or splintering uh, adjacent to joint edges. And in this case, it's illustrated by this adhesive ceramic tiling, which are probably not very well connected with the support. And people have stepped on it somehow, and they have broken it. The next one is wear or scaling of the finishing coat. It is illustrated here by 
a, a door and window frame in which, as you can see, this finishing coat has been lost through erosion or possibly also mishandling of the window frame. Um, scratches, grooves, and deep wear are the next defect, which is illustrated here by a natural stone cladding. It is very clear that this natural stone is inadequate to the environment, or it was a very poor uh, choice of material. In any case, it's, it's no longer fit for use. Uh, the next step, the next uh, defect is called warpage, swelling, deformation, and other flatness deficiencies. And it's illustrated here by a clearly warped door and window frame. Of course, it has to do with age, but also possibly with uh, rising dam. Now here, we are not sure what happened here. This is, uh, this is called a material gap in puncture and it is a large hole in a natural stone cladding, possibly vandalism. It was possibly made, made intentionally by some uh, people who do not like this property. Uh, detachment is the next defect. In this case, this wall render is so detached that nowadays it looks as if it has only the, the initial substrate, which was actually natural stone. In this case, it's interesting because we wonder whether it would not be better to just leave the natural stone as it is because it looks nicer. But anyway, it is a defect. The final uh, uh, defects of the mechanical nature that I want to show you uh, concern loss of adhesion, which is quite common in adhesive ceramic cladding tiling as this one, in which over time, this is not exactly any problem of design or of application. These tiles are simply very, very old. And over time, somehow, they lost adhesion to the substrate. The next, the next uh, defect is uh, called bending and rupture of metallic fastening elements. And in this case, in an external cladding of a pitched roof, we can see that this metallic fastening element is no longer working properly. Now, moving on to the other defects, the first one that I want to show you is called flaws in tail end elements. Tail end are uh, 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 individual locations, singularities, in which it is quite often to that uh, problems occur. And in this case of an external cladding of a pitch roof, you can see that it is very damaged, okay? Then the next one is called misalignment of cladding elements. And misalignment is self-explanatory. You can see it very well, even from a, a large distance, from a long distance, you can see that these natural stone claddings are not aligned with the others. The next uh, defect is called finishing defects, discontinuities in architectural concrete surfaces. And as you can see, this, this uh, concrete surface is very defective. It was, there were several problems. As you, as you can see, the porosity of this uh, 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 concrete surface is way beyond what is acceptable. The next one is called finishing color flaws in painted facades. And again, it's self-explanatory. You can see very well that this painted facade does not look at all well. Um, it is probably linked to um, humidity, okay? And lack of maintenance as well. The next one is called finishing texture flaws in painted facades. And as you can see, there are several defects of texture in this uh, photograph. The next one is called degradation of the filling materials of current joints. So in this case, uh, you can see very well that the, these natural stone claddings uh, joints are, uh, you know, not not in a not in a very good condition. This is probably due 
to the fact that they have not been maintained over time. The next defect is called absence or loss of the filling material in connecting elements or current joints. In these cases, you can see we have uh, natural stone claddings and uh, uh, it's very easy to see that they, the, the, the joints that were supposed to be filled are no longer filled. These are not joints that were supposed to be loose, empty. Uh, no, uh, they just lost the, the, the material inside over time and it was not replaced. The next, the next defect is called uh, inadequate operation of expansion joints in flat roofs. Expansion joints are always a problem. Uh, even when they are correctly designed, and correctly applied, they are always, uh, uh, you know, one weakness of the buildings. And in, in this case, as you can see, this uh, uh, expansion joint has not been maintained for a long time and it does not look good at all. So the next defect is called insufficient or excessive overlap of the cladding elements in roofs. And it is illustrated here by some roof tiles, which as you can see, have serious problems. Uh, these, we don't know the cause of these. It may, it may be that the, some roof tiles slip uh, down um, or they may, ha may have been positioned wrongly in the first place. But the, the fact is with these detailing, uh, water will get inside the, the building. The next <clears throat> defect is called clearance, clearances gaps in door and window frames. And it's self-explanatory. You can see very easily that this window frame is not uh, airtight or even watertight at all. The next uh, defect is called absent or damaged hinges or locks in doors and in door and window frames. And again, it's self-explanatory. This, this lock is very rusty uh, and it, it, is, it should be replaced. The door itself is also not very healthy. Uh, the next one is uh, ponding insufficient or excessive slope in roofs. Uh, in this case, a flat roof, you can see very easily that there is accumulation of water there and it, no accumulation of water is supposed to occur in flat roofs. They are called flat, but actually they do have a slope so that water does not remain in there for a long time because uh, when that happens and normally the water finally gets inside the house. The next defects are called inadequate operation of elements of the rainwater drainage system. And you can see that this, uh, the detailing of uh, the opening here of the downspout, the downspout is the vertical drainage pipe that is in here is not correctly detailed. And even this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, accessory is not positioned on place. The next one, is called deficient capping agents in two flat roofs. And as you can see, the, the, the capping here of this flat roof is not correct because as you can see, there is actually no capping at all. And so water can get in, in there, okay? Uh, uh, on the back of the, 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 the waterproofing membrane, which by the way, is not the, the best one, okay? This is, this is a, 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 um, a one type of, uh, of uh, uh, waterproofing membrane that is now no longer used because it has durability problems. And in this case, it's obvious that the water will get in there because the capping is not correctly done. The next defect is called incorrect or deficient interventions in claddings of pit roofs. And in this case, it's also very clear that the intervention was not done properly and water is getting in inside the building in that location. So the intervention in this case was negative instead of being positive. <clears throat> well, we've reached the end of this journey. I hope 
it's not very depressing. We need to understand how buildings uh, react when we do not design or build them or use them properly, okay? And of course, we need to accept that buildings age just like everything else. So some of these defects that I've shown you are normal defects, but in some cases, just like going to the doctor, we can act on buildings by maintaining and repairing them at times. So um, I'd just like to make a few final remarks. Uh, this very short presentation is obviously not the end of, of this, this subject. Uh, I, I presented here basically a catalog of building defects. Uh, uh, we have a much, uh, uh, much longer and, 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 and uh, uh, larger catalog of photos of all of these defects in which we have uh, for each type of element, uh, for each type of defect, we even have uh, um, uh, uh, gravity levels, uh, severity levels of each of these defects. So it's a very large catalog, but uh, this catalog that I showed you is just uh, exemplary uh, and it shows uh, how we can classify in uh, buildings and elements of buildings, we can classify them in terms of the defects and the severity of the defect. Now, uh, as you can well understand, the diagnosis was not fully made in this case. The only way to make a diagnosis is to go to the place and actually uh, diagnose the causes. And sometimes uh, a full diagnosis is needed. And for a full diagnosis, what do you need? You need the uh, uh, identification of the probable causes, which we did not do properly in this case. We need to determine whether there is a need for further diagnosis methods, like for characterization of the defects, for confirmation of the causes, okay? <clears throat> normally, normally we don't need them. And when we do need them, that means extra time and extra money. So we need to make sure that they are indeed necessary. And uh, we would need also to recommend a course of action. We would, uh, uh, give a recommendation whether we should, for example, implement maintenance works or we should do um, either curative repairs, which means that we act on simply on the, the defect or preventive repairs in which we act on the causes. Okay. And that, of course, should be based on whatever we find in our diagnosis. And of course, then we would need to provide full data about the whole inspection of the building to whoever decides what to do, because in the end, someone pays for all of this. So the decision maker needs to have all the information. Normally, the decision maker is faced with a shortage of funding, which means that choices need to be made. It's just like our car. We, we, can't, we can't go to, to, the, the, to, to have the car repaired every time we have a single scratch on the car. So we need to kind of have scratches enough to justify going to uh, the, 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 the repair uh, and uh, repair the, 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 the car because it, it costs money. In here, we need to do uh, similar decisions. So what I showed you, is just a very small part of the working of uh, um, maintaining a building in its proper state. And uh, I think that's that's all. I'm not sure I, I, I am uh, how I am in time because I, I lost track, uh, but um, thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, and uh, I am uh, uh, at your disposal for any questions that you may need. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Brito. It was a very nice and uh, very uh, holistic approach to the problems. Uh, actually, uh, as uh, this is also related to my area, uh, I wanted to ask some questions. 
It looks like all the problems are coming from water. So actually water is our uh, basic material for living. So this, uh, and, uh, but in this case, it was, we do not want water to, to grow inside our structures, our structural elements, etc. Uh, as water is life for us, it is life, it is life also for bacteria, for vegetation, and uh, for other things. So, uh, is there any universal approach uh, to this problem, so to, to make water useful, not, not a problem in this case? It is interesting that you should pose that question. I, I, I came originally from, from structural engineering, yeah. And um, my master's thesis was on, on, on pathology of uh, concrete structures. Um, but then I came to know that, you know, about, I would say, at least 95% of the problems in construction are not structurally related. Yeah. And about 98% of the problems in a building are indeed connected with water. Yes. So uh, the universal approach to water is keep it out, <laughs> keep it out. We need to keep water out of the construction, okay? I know it's life, but uh, uh, it must come through the tap, <laughs> not through the roof uh, or the windows. So um, uh, it is indeed a, a big problem uh, because um, uh, uh, the, the, the way to avoid water from getting inside the house has to do with, with such things as, as slope of the roofs, detailing of the windows and, and doors, um, detailing of the drainage system, detailing of the waterproofing system, detailing of the walls. And one common thing about all of these things is that there is no compulsory design project about any of these things. There is a compulsory design project about structures. There is one compulsory design project about architecture, but there is no mention of being compulsory, for example, designing the waterproofing or designing the drainage system. And the result is that part is, is only inserted in the architect pro, uh, architectural uh, project, okay? And only if the architectural project is very detailed, which many times does not happen because it's not compulsory, at least here in Portugal. And so the, uh, since, the, since the owners do not wish to pay money to the architects or to whoever does that project, uh, uh, the project is absent. And then the, the, the solutions are not in the project and they are sold in situ by the contractor, which also is not an expert on these things, okay? And so normally, very, very frequently, these issues are not treated properly at the design stage. And there is a rule called the, the I think it's the, the five rule, okay? Which means that if we solve a problem a specific problem at the design stage, we may have to pay, uh, let's say, X euros to, to solve that problem. But if we solve the same problem at the construction stage, we have to pay five times as much to solve the same problem. And if we have to solve that problem at the use stage, we will have to pay 25 times more than we would if we had solved that problem at the design stage. So the, the solution is really working at the design stage and not the other stages. And that quite often does not happen. Thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation and for your comments and everything. It's, it's a pleasure to have you in, in our activities and also to listen to your experience and uh, presentations. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Arthur Schultz, Professor of Structural Engineering at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Schultz, for being 
our uh, one of our keynote speakers. Uh, we would like to hear from your experience, especially as you know, while we met last year, uh, you came here in Albania for the investigation of these buildings demolished and uh, deteriorated because of the earthquake, of the last earthquake. So uh, we are all ears to, to listen to your presentation. Thank you again for being part of this activity. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, Dr. Luga, and thank you very much uh, for everyone in attendance. I hope that I will have something to share with you that will that will be of value to you. Um, I'm uh, reaching out to you from uh, San Antonio, as uh, Dr. Luga mentioned. Uh, so I'm a good distance away. Um, I need to pull up my presentation. Can you see my uh, screen? Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I would like to speak with you today about some thoughts I have on the influence of unreinforced masonry infills on the performance of reinforced concrete buildings during earthquakes. Uh, as uh, Dr. Luga mentioned, I was in uh, Tirana uh, in January of this year with a, uh, an international group of engineers. Uh, and we were hosted by Dr. Mustafa Rai and, and Dr. Luga and we uh, investigated or at least uh, surveyed a number of buildings in the Duras area. Um, I thank you very much for your hospitality at that time as well. Uh, I was really hoping that this conference could be held in Tirana so that uh, I could once again enjoy the company of my friends in Albania, uh, enjoy the wonderful seafood in Duras and just your beautiful country. But uh, it's, it was not to be. Uh, in any case, uh, let, me, let me move on. Um, so I have organized my comments in, you know, five different areas. What's the problem? Um, what do we know about the performance under earthquakes? Uh, how can we analyze infills? Uh, and then how can we retrofit them and repair them? And then some concluding remarks um, regarding these issues. So reinforced concrete, the problem is that reinforced concrete buildings that have masonry infills, as you well know, are vulnerable to seismic damage. And that follows from the fact that the materials are both brittle and weak, which is um, not a great combination. Um, as displacement sensitive materials, they damage very early in the loading process, somewhere between 0.1% to 0.25% uh, of the height of the building in terms of lateral displacement. Now, once it gets damaged, uh, the masonry will actually start to crumble, to fall apart, and the debris is hazardous. Um, first of all, because it's heavy and it can fall and hurt or kill people, uh, but also it tends to block uh, ways uh, or pathways to exit buildings um, uh, after, during an earthquake. So they're doubly dangerous. So why do we use them? We've known about these problems for a long, long time. And the reason we use them is that they're functionally desirable and we don't really have very good alternatives. We need to have strong walls to keep the outside from the inside of a building. Uh, we need to separate corridors from uh, apartments. And uh, short of reinforced concrete walls, the best material is masonry. It is uh, easy to put, it is uh, flexible in terms of architectural design. We can do a lot with it. Unfortunately, it is not a good material, uh, at least in its natural form during an earthquake. So there's a variety of different uh, damages that you can find in these buildings. Um, some are associated uh, with the masonry itself. And so if you have weak mortar you, and strong units, you may get sliding along horizontal joints. This is especially pronounced 
when the length of the infill panel is much larger than the height, you can get uh, cracking along the diagonals, either in the form of a stair stepped uh, configuration if the units are strong or cracks that go through the units if they're not strong. Uh, you can get compression damage in the, along the diagonals, either in the center or near the uh, beam column joints of the frame. And you will always have separation as well as regions where the masonry compresses against the frame. And that can produce either damage to the masonry or damage to the frame. The frame itself can have damage because the frame is also sharing in a resisting load. So damage to the beam column joints can be common if they're not designed properly. Uh, damage to the beams in particular, shear damage and damage to the columns can also be uh, present. We can also have outer plane damage and that's the probably the worst. Um, and this will occur because the connections between the frame and the infill are weak or they're separated if there's a gap or if there's damage to the infill uh, due to in-plane loading that produces the diagonal cracks that we saw earlier. And then out of plane loading, uh, there's nothing to resist it in the panel. And so it simply collapses out of plane. This tends to be some of the more troublesome damage uh, in infill panels. Uh, it's expensive to repair. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be deadly. So let me share with you um, some instances of damage that I've, that I've seen. Uh, starting with uh, Ecuador, the 2016 earthquake that occurred uh, along the Pacific, Central Pacific coast. Ecuador is just, uh, uh, just north of uh, Peru, uh, near the town of Muisne. Uh, it was a 7.8 moment magnitude event with an EMS 98 intensity of uh, as high as nine in some of the hardest hit regions. Uh, Ecuador uh, has almost exclusively reinforced concrete frames with masonry infill as their structural system for buildings. You do find single story homes that might be made out of other materials, wood or adobe, but typically if you have more than two stories, it's going to be an RC frame with masonry infill. In fact, it's such a dominant structural system that even stairwells and elevator shafts are often built as uh, concrete frames with infill. Um, in the region that was affected, buildings typically did not exceed 10 stories. Um, and most of the damage that we saw was in uh, buildings that were somewhat lower than that. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, on the left, you see an interior wall. Um, it, you can clearly see the clay masonry. You can see the diagonal cracking that has formed, obviously on the uh, on the cover that has been uh, placed on top of the masonry, but that is there, of course, because the masonry has also cracked. And you also see spalling in regions where compression damage has begun in the masonry. So this is very common. Now, if the earthquake stops at this point, uh, there is a chance you may be able to somehow repair this. But if it goes on longer and these cracks become wider, then there is, uh, a high likelihood that this wall can collapse out of plane because it has no support anymore. On the right side, you see a four-story building. This was a hospital building, uh, typical infill, um, uh, in this case, concrete, well, clay and concrete, depending on which part of the hospital, and a reinforced concrete frame. The reinforced concrete frame was very, very well designed and built. There was hardly any damage uh, to the concrete but you can see that the damage to the infill is catastrophic, completely catastrophic. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that you see again and again in countries that are susceptible to seismic uh, movements and also have this type of construction. Um, here you see a building, in fact, a couple of shots, two buildings that were pretty close to each other. Um, these were taller buildings um, the, on the left, the building has an architecturally more 
Uh, interesting facade, you see a cantilever section here. Uh, you see the floor plan is not fully orthogonal. And so all of that makes for something that's very interesting to see. But at the same time, you have a portion of the building that is not well supported except for this cantilever slab. Um, and in fact, typically these were waffle slabs. We, we were not able to observe whether or not these were waffle slabs, but in our lightened slab. Um, but that's a, a very scary proposition that you have such a large overhang carrying so much weight. Here you see a more traditional building, but you see also damage to the unreinforced masonry. Now I bring to your attention the fact that the masonry here is not bounded on either side by a frame member, by a column. Um, that's not what we intend for uh, infill masonry. When we uh, analyze infill masonry, when we talk about its design, we typically show beams top and bottom uh, and then columns on both sides. And that's important because there is a transfer of forces that occurs between the infill panel and the frame members. And there is no place for that transfer to occur here. This edge of this panel is supported by an unreinforced masonry panel that's out of plane. And then this is a perfect example of the issue of the debris. So if you were in this stairwell, or in this hallway during the earthquake, there's a good chance you would have gotten badly hurt or even killed. If you were not, if you were at a safer location, then when you tried to leave the building, it would be very difficult. And you certainly wouldn't want to try to leave the building when all of that debris is falling down, but even after the fact, it would be difficult. And so that's one of the really negative aspects of this. If I go back a decade, there was a similar earthquake in a similar region, in this case in Peru, just south of Ecuador, along the Central Pacific coast. This, in this case, it was a MoMA magnitude eight event. Um, in, in Peru, they have a larger variety of structural systems that you'll find in buildings. But in the region we were, there were a fair number of reinforced concrete frame buildings with masonry infill, uh, with a masonry being either clay brick or concrete block. Um, a lot of the materials that we saw, particularly the masonry materials, were either uh, handmade or were uh, produced in a semi-industrial manner. They were not very strong. Uh, you could easily break them. You know, you could take a brick and throw it at another one and it would, it would break. Uh, and that, uh, we strongly believe, contributed to some of the problems we saw. The buildings in the region that we studied, that we surveyed, was were a little uh, less tall than the ones in, in Ecuador, but nonetheless. This first photograph is for a, for a building in um, a university campus near the city of Ica. Uh, the buildings were well-designed, well-maintained, well-constructed, yet here you can see what happened. And in fact, the designer of this building wanted to leave a gap between the frame and the infill panel so as to avoid damage. Um, the problem is that you need to provide a load path for the, out of, the loads generated by out of plane loading. Otherwise, one is going to slip relative to the other. And this is another building in the same campus. And in this case, the infill has completely collapsed as essentially a solid body rotating out of place. Nearby, this was in a, in a school. You can see um, the gap, of course, the gap probably became larger than it was during construction. But down here, you can see the elastomeric material that was used for the seismic gap. This seismic gap is, in this case, exceeds one inch. That's more than 25 millimeters. Um, and there is no way for the elastomeric to prevent this panel from moving relative to that frame out of plane. And so that is a detail um, that requires attention. You need to provide some kind of detail, some kind of structural element that would prevent this panel to move out of plane relative to the concrete frame. So in an attempt to avoid that kind of thing, what we also saw um, was uh, uh, bar anchors that were uh, embedded in the concrete columns and then these would coincide with uh, bed joints in the mortar. And the idea was to use these to anchor the uh, masonry infill to the columns, but clearly it didn't work in this case. 
the masonry panel still collapsed out of plane. And of course, it doesn't help to have these anchors if the mortar is very weak. And if you have weak mortar, then you're not going to get a good stress transfer between the anchors themselves and the mortar. Now let's fast forward to uh, Albania in 2019 and the catastrophic earthquake at the end of November, 6.4 with MMI uh, ratings of as much as eight in some of the worst hit regions. And we spent our time in Duras and the surrounding cities and we looked exclusively at reinforced concrete buildings infilled with clay. This is a photograph of a building probably not more than uh, 20 years old. Here you can see, this could almost be a picture. I, if I took this picture and I inserted it in the section on Ecuador or Peru, it wouldn't look out of place. Same problem, um, even though we're half a world away. On the right side in the same building, you, you see an entire panel uh, along the corridor um, that has begun to collapse. Fortunately, it tried to collapse inward and was stopped by the door. But like some of the details that I showed you in Ecuador and in Peru, there is nothing supporting this panel here or on the other side. And so how can you not expect that panel to move if you don't have um, the detail that's necessary to provide the reaction forces um, when it's loaded in plane and out of plane? This is another building, a very uh, modern three-story complex, um, pretty tall. And this is the main stairwell. This is one of the apartments. And you can see that the infill here has completely collapsed. Um, it's made it very hazardous to go up and down the stairs. Um, this building, we spent over an hour and we could not find evidence of structural damage anywhere. Um, but the amount of non-structural damage was uh, very high. I would hate to think, I would hate to have to pay the bill for the repair of that building. We also had the fortune of finding a building that was under construction. And we entered that building. At the time, uh, only some of the exterior infill partitions had been uh, installed and none on the inside. This gives us the opportunity to uh, look at the structure itself, the load bearing part of the structure. And we didn't find any damage. Um, and uh, of course, it was a lot less weight because there were no occupants and not all of the masonry was in place. Uh, but this uh, notion that the structures themselves were well designed and well built um, also was evident. This was a little in the outskirts, a little farther away, another building under construction. Uh, and here we saw evidence in some of the columns that there was the initiation of compression damage, as you might find when a plastic hinge begins to form uh, in the first story columns where you would expect them to form in a first story column, but only the initiation. This is only minor spalling. And so once again, the idea that we have is that very few of these buildings were loaded to a point where the reinforced concrete frame um, was pushed very hard. It, it's just that the masonry infills could not withstand the motions. So how do we analyze that? Either when we're designing a building uh, or when we're trying to fix a building, either repair or to retrofit. Well, there's a number of different uh, approaches to analyzing these infill frames. Um, They've been classified, as you see here, either ma macro modeling, meso modeling, or micro modeling. So the oldest is the macro modeling approach. And in the macro modeling approach, you replace the infill with a frame member. Uh, an inclined, in most cases, an inclined frame member along the diagonal of the infill. Uh, in the meso modeling approach, you use finite elements. You use continuum finite elements um, to represent the entire infill. Uh, in other words, you smear the properties so that you have a single material that represents the masonry units, the mortar, and the interfaces. In the case of micromodeling, uh, you no longer smear the materials. You have continuum elements for the masonry units, and then you have 
uh, uh, interface elements for the combination of the interfaces and the mortar, or if you want to get very sophisticated, um, the, the, you have separate uh, continuum elements for the units and the mortar, and then you have interface elements for the interface between those materials. The macro modeling approach, um, as I indicated earlier, is simply to identify a portion of the panel that is going to resist a significant portion of the loading. And then you replace that, uh, you, you, I, you assume that all of the load then is carried by that loaded diagonal. The trick, of course, is to figure out what the width of that diagonal is and what its constitutive properties are, so that when you analyze the building with diagonals instead of the infill panels, you come up with uh, forces and displacements that are consistent with what you would get in the infill frame itself. Um, a fair amount of work has been done on this, and uh, uh, these models have been calibrated with either finite element analysis or experimental work. Here you see a, a large frame in which all of the infills, which were our masonry, have all been replaced with these diagonal compression struts. So you essentially have a braced frame. This is an old concept. It's now going on 60 years old. It was uh, in 1960, it was first proposed by Polyakov. And then a number of others have refined that method and continue to do so today. Um, some of the notable contributions are from people like Brian Stafford Smith, uh, Liao and Quan, um, Flanagan and Bennett, Chris Afuli, Asterisk, and others. Now, for this uh, approach to work, you have to have at least some elements of the nonlinear response of the infill. Um, and so you have to use constitutive properties when defining the, prop the, the uh, properties of those uh, diagonals um, for that purpose. Uh, you, you have to have different properties for tension and compression struts. Um, if you have cyclic loading, you have to have the two of these. Uh, people have introduced concepts like tension stiffening or shear response in order to improve the accuracy of, of their computations. Um, and, and these models have become considerably more complex. But in spite of all of this complexity, you can still analyze a large frame using this approach uh, with these macro models uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And so it's a, it's a very practical approach. But if you want greater accuracy, then you need to go to the, uh, uh, the finite element approaches. So you can go into the mesomodeling approach where your masonry units and the mortar and the interfaces, all of those are combined to create the smeared material. A variety of different constitutive formulations have been used to try to improve the accuracy. And a number of people have done very good work in this area, Danasakar and Page, Lofty and Shing. And then we go to the micro modeling approach. And this is where you now separate or distinguish between the masonry units and the interfaces. Um, or in the case of the more uh, uh, detailed one, you distinguish between the mortar, the units and the interfaces. So there are concerns associated with a computational effort here. And so it is so great that, for example, this has only been done for 2D structures. Uh, you can't really do this with 3D elements. Um, smeared uh, crack models no longer work very well in some of these. So you have to go to discrete crack models. They work better, but they're a lot more complicated. Um, but if, you know, if you go through the trouble, people have obtained very, very good results. In particular, some of the work by Benson Shing uh, with Lofty, with Morabi, or with uh, 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 Andreas Stavridis. Here is an analysis uh, done by Stavridis and Shing. Um, this is uh, at the point where the peak capacity, the peak force capacity of the model was reached. And this is at the onset of failure. Um, and you can see that a, a large number of behaviors are captured here that we saw earlier in some of the damage uh, uh, 
photographs from various earthquakes. Okay, so we can model the system. We know that they have to be analyzed and we know that care has to be taken. So what do we do after the building has been built, either before the strong earthquake hits it or after an earthquake hits it? Well, we have to retrofit it or repair it. And so there are a number of techniques that have been proposed. I can't clearly go through all of them, but I'll go through a few. The first group in this slide I refer to as invasive techniques. And maybe that's a bit of a strong word, but you'll see what I mean. So the first one is to remove the infill and retrofit the frame members to create a ductile frame system. Now, if you've lost all of the infills and the frame is still okay, well, that probably it makes sense. It probably doesn't require much work to make the frame ductile if it, if it resisted the motions, okay? Um, but if you have a building that has cracked infills, a lot of cracked infills, uh, to remove those infills is gonna be expensive. Um, and to create a ductile system depends on how good the frame itself is. And one thing to keep in mind is that when you do that, okay, you're going to end up with a frame system that's a lot more flexible than an infill build, uh, frame building. Okay. Um, another one is to remove the infill and install ductile braces. And in this case, real braces, such as the buckling restrained braces or the unbonded braces. These are systems that comprise a number of components. It includes an outer shell of steel, um, an inner uh, uh, steel uh, uh, core uh, that's made out of a ductile steel. And then uh, between that core and the inside uh, surface of, of the tube, you fill it with concrete or mortar. The idea then is that you establish the connections to the core, not to the tube. The tube is there only to provide pressure so that when you compress this brace um, um, and, and it attempts to buckle, uh, it presses to, against the concrete or the mortar, which then presses against the tube, which will press back and prevent buckling. Um, they're very effective, but they're expensive and, and they're heavy and they require a fair amount of construction labor and construction planning to put into place. So the notion that you can go to a, a, an existing building that has infills and you're going to remove the infills and attach some of these braces is a, a, a bit difficult to, to envision. If it's a steel uh, frame with a masonry infill, then it's may be a little more feasible, but even then these braces uh, transfer large forces to the frame and you need to do a lot of detailing at those frame connections so that they work properly without damaging the frame. Okay, uh, let's move on then. So you can remove the infill and you can replace them with something else. How about reinforced concrete? We can detail a reinforced concrete wall so that it is strong and ductile, more ductile than masonry. Um, and if this were a new building, that would be a very easy thing to do. But to introduce um, a new wall element, infill wall element, means that you have to anchor the reinforcement in that uh, concrete wall in the frame. And that may be uh, challenging, but it is a possibility. And you don't have to use reinforced concrete, you can use reinforced masonry as a possibility. And then the last option is to install a seismic isolation system. Having gone through the list here, you now see why I refer to these as invasive techniques. Uh, they may work in a limited number of cases, but by and large, these are all very expensive. I mentioned that because I was in Nepal after the earthquake and there were several American engineers walking around Nepal telling people, oh, you need to knock down all of your infills. Now they weren't trying to make a ductile frame system. They just simply said, take the infills down and put a dry wall system with cold form steel studs. And that's a recipe for disaster because the building is going to deflect a lot. The dry wall and steel stud system has very little strength and stiffness. And now you don't even have the infill to provide what little bit of resistance it provided to the original building. 
Okay. So let's talk about some less invasive techniques. So an old one is to take welded wire grids um, and to attach them to the frame on top of the infill and then put a, a coat of plaster or stucco. The only problem with things like this is that that welded wire grid has to be anchored. So you have to have anchors that go into the beams and into the column. And so that takes uh, work. Uh, there are materials uh, involved and it takes time. If you're willing to do that, then you can apply the plaster um, with a trowel or you can apply a stucco. Um, you can spray it on. Okay, um, even less in invasive techniques um, are the use of ECC um, um, overlays, an engineered cementitious composite. So you have a cementitious matrix formulated to give you properties that are going to make it perform well in the system, uh, including uh, fiber, either metallic or non-metallic fiber. So the material that you end up with is ECC will be stronger, have greater tensile strength, and it will be tougher and some energy dissipation than um, certainly than the infill and more so than just a layer of concrete or mortar. The application of this is relatively simple. You know, you do have to prepare the surface and clean it, but you don't have to anchor anything into the, the, the uh, frame. Other options are to use FRP sheets or strips diagonally or horizontally, or the one that's been used uh, a lot, I would say this past decade is the textile reinforced masonry, the TRM overlay. This is typically an FRP sheet that is uh, attached to the masonry, but it, the uh, anchors are much less invasive than the ones for the welded wire grids. And then you cover it with uh, mortar. One of the advantages here is that the mortar is gonna be cheaper and easier to work with than an engineered cementitious material, number one. Number two, uh, since it's mortar, you can formulate it with either cement or lime, depending on what masonry you have underneath, so that it's compatible. If you put an engineered cementitious composite on an old limestone, uh, I'm sorry, lime-based mortar masonry, uh, there, you're going to have incompatibility and you're going to generate stresses between the two simply because of that incompatibility. Here you see some um, drawings of buildings that were tested, uh, on, uh, or frames that were tested in the laboratory by a number of researchers where you have brick infill and a reinforced concrete frame. You see the crack and the crushing damage that occurred during the test. And then the sister frames that were built the same way, but had uh, textile reinforced masonry overlays. And you can see that with the exception of this case in the middle, all of the others developed um, a fair amount less damage uh, as they were loaded to the same number of cycles and peak displacements uh, than their counterparts. So it's a, a, a reasonable um, uh, solution that you can use it's not going to avoid damage. It's difficult to avoid damage altogether in masonry, but it's certainly going to uh, reduce the amount of damage that you have, and it will reduce the likelihood that you're going to have an outer plane collapse. Okay, so with this, I reached the end of my talk. I have some concluding remarks to, to share with you, um, beginning with the fact that we know that RC buildings with masonry and infills are, are vulnerable to damage and can be hazardous. Uh, evaluation requires that we use appropriate tools. And I discussed three different categories of uh, uh, analytical tools that you can use to evaluate these systems. Um, a number of repair techniques have been developed and, and verified. All of the techniques I showed you earlier you've, ha have proven to provide some measure, some um, uh, reasonable measure of improvement on uh, the strength, the stiffness, and the ductility of uh, the frames in which they were uh, installed. There are more invasive techniques, uh, but they, they will require much more attention. And uh, I personally think that the ECC and the TRM overlays uh, are the best because they're economical, minimally invasive, 
And they're effective in enhancing performance and are probably the least costly of the techniques that I discussed here. Well, with that, I want to thank you very much. Um, I really uh, am very pleased to, to have the opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, and I look forward to uh, questions you may have and the other sessions um, during the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Professor Schutz. Now, if anyone from the audience has any questions to Professor Schutz regarding this wonderful and very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for your presentation to the Senea. I would like, sorry. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you have any specific standard in US, for example, regarding how the uh, APL walls are constructed? Like, uh, is there any compulsory uh, or is there any uh, procedure, let's say, that uh, the workers have to fulfill? Because, as you know, uh, we always uh, design it as a non-structural member and we don't uh, take much attention on these uh, simple details, but at the end, in, in an earthquake, they can cause a lot of damage. So if a structure that uh, technically correct uh, is, has been designed and has not suffered any structural damage, but in terms of uh, uh, infill walls, there are a lot of damage. Is there any standard procedure in the US that uh, specifies these things or? There are. Uh in different standards, there are uh, procedures that you are supposed to follow. For example, leaving a gap, a seismic gap with material to use in there and how to restrain uh, the infill if you're doing that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schultz. So we, we came to the end of this first uh, session, to the introductory session. Uh, we are going to have a short break of 10 minutes and we will continue with, uh, with Professor Corral. Uh, so just a short break to, to, to have a coffee and we will continue. <laughs>